This video is brought to you by the Out of Stonk Discord server. Are you having troubles getting your hands on the newest NVIDIA and AMD hardware? Join the Out of Stonk Discord server so you can get pinged as soon as any of the parts you're looking for go in stock. Link in the description. This is the MSI MPG Artemis 343CQR, an awesome ultra-wide gaming monitor with a horrible name. I'm probably going to pronounce it wrong the entire video too. This is the second ultra-wide monitor I'll be reviewing with the Alienware AW3821DW being the first. So I'll probably be making some comparisons between the two, just a heads up. We'll start with the basics. The Artemis is a 34-inch ultra-wide gaming monitor, has a 1440p VA panel, has a 165Hz refresh rate with an 8-bit color depth, and a 10-bit color depth with 144Hz, has Vesa's Display HDR400 certification, and has FreeSync Premium. The design is super gamer-focused. The legs are made entirely out of metal, look like they came straight out of Star Fox 64, and somehow managed to be bigger than the Alienware's legs with a 25-inch wingspan and a depth of 13 inches. The stand is covered in plastic, one with your typical matte finish and one with a glossy centerpiece. It also includes a wire routing hole. Moving to the rear, you have the same plastic mixture as you do with the stand. Matte and gloss plastic with a diagonal RGB strip, RGB branding, and a plastic cover to cover the screws you need to screw the stand to the rear of the monitor. I have no clue why MSI continues to use this type of stand mount mechanism. Every other company moves to the simple slide it in and automatically lock approach, but MSI requires you to do some manual labor like some kind of caveman. But while we're back here, it includes 100 by 100 vase and mounting holes, and for I.O., it includes two HDMI 2.0 ports, one DisplayPort 1.4 port, one USB 3.2 Gen 1 Type-C DisplayPort, a headphone jack, and a USB Type-B port to power the two USB 3.2 Gen 1 Type-A ports. Moving to the front, it has a 1000R curve, which is the same curve that the Samsung Odyssey G series of monitors have. So it's pretty curvy, but I don't think that's a bad thing. The size of this monitor warrants a decent curve, and I feel like looking at an ultra-wide with a small or no curve would not be as good of an experience. It has 9.5mm top and side bezels, and a 22mm chin. There's some MSI branding on the center of the chin, a cable bungee which can be placed on the right or left side of the monitor, and a headphone holder on the right. In terms of flexibility, it has tilt, height, swivel, but no pivot. Overall, I think the design is fine. The only thing I hate, as regular viewers already know, are the legs because they take up so much desk space. I wish they would just use a square base, but that's just a preference. What do I know? Now, if you have a large mouse pad and you do end up purchasing this monitor, make sure your desk is at least 27 inches long, otherwise you won't be able to fit everything. If it's not long enough, a monitor arm or stand would be necessary. Now, since this is a gaming monitor, I'll focus on the gaming-focused stuff first, like the pixel response times, black equalizer, and so on. If you care more about the monitor's color performance and want to watch that first, use the chapters below. Starting with the pixel response times, the Artemis has four levels of overdrive. Normal, fast, fastest, and NPRT, which is just an acronym for motion pixel response time. Really though, it's just backlight strobing, so I'm not sure why they went with that name. Starting with 165Hz, the MSI doesn't look that great overall. If you keep it on the normal overdrive setting, it looks fine, but going to fast or fastest introduces overshoot without making the image noticeably clearer. If you enable MPRT, aka backlight strobing, it makes the image clear, but with a lot of smeary looking ghosts. It's just not great. Compare all that to the Alienware on its fast overdrive setting, which is the lowest and the best for 144Hz, and I think it looks better than the MSI with its backlight strobing turned off. Now sure, the MSI with its backlight strobing does perform better than the Alienware, but it doesn't look as good as most if not all other backlight strobing technologies I've seen from other manufacturers. I suspect that's because of the VA panel, since VA panels usually don't have the pixel response times of a TN or even an IPS panel. But regardless, the results leave much to be desired. Dropping to 60Hz, we see something weird. Do you notice it? All three overdrive settings have overshoot. That's right. Even the lowest level has overshoot, so if you're playing a game where you're getting around 60 FPS or lower, you're going to have to deal with having overshoot. Now this isn't terrible, but it's still something you shouldn't have to see, and I hope MSI releases a firmware update that lowers or optimizes the voltage delivery to the pixels to get rid of the overshoot, if that's even possible. With that said though, even though I'm bashing the pixel response times a little bit here, you may not even notice it because of how faint it is. And being that this is an ultra-wide, if you're the type of person who's looking for the best competitive gaming experience, I'm not sure why you're looking at ultra-wides, especially a VA panel one with a max refresh rate of 165Hz. 
See, the whole point of an ultra-wide monitor is productivity and a more immersive gaming experience that a 16x9 monitor can't provide. But I'll talk more about that in a second. First, we have to talk about the black equalizer on this monitor because it is pretty cool. It has five levels, off, normal, strong, strongest, and the coolest one, AI. Now, you might be saying, what's so cool about AI? Glad you asked. Let's start with the extreme escape from Tarkov garage test. With the black equalizer off, things are pretty dark and I definitely won't feel confident in my ability to see an enemy easily, if at all. Now, just like most monitors with a black equalizer, when you increase the setting, the screen gets brighter. No exception here. So let's take a look at each increase. We have normal, strong, and strongest. With a black equalizer set to the strongest setting, things are much brighter than if it were off, making it much easier to see where somebody's hiding. So far, so good. Now let's look at AI. Wait, what? This is darker than a previous setting. That sucks. No, not quite. See, what AI does is it analyzes the brightness of what you're looking at, and if the scene is bright, it lowers the amount of equalizing, and when it's dark, it'll increase it. This means that when you're in the garage, the monitor will make it brighter, and when you're outside in the sun, in the game, not real life, because us gamers don't go outside, then it'll equalize less, unless it's nighttime in game. However, it's not perfect, because it doesn't seem to analyze everything at a pixel level, but rather total brightness. So if you're in the garage and it's super dark, cool, it'll do what you want. But as soon as you look at a light source, the monitor thinks that it needs to decrease the amount of equalizing. That's not ideal, but it's much better than when I reviewed the MSI MAG251RX, which for some reason, MSI thought it was a good idea to increase the brightness of a scene when it was already bright, and then when it was dark, darken it further. If they just threw an Uno reverse card at it, that would have fixed the AI problem with that monitor. Moving to Siege though, here's the black equalizer off, then normal, then strong, then strongest, then AI. Now here's the thing, it really depends on what game you're playing to determine what black equalizer setting you're going to use. With Siege, because there are light sources everywhere in this scene, and the monitor thinks the game is bright enough, it actually doesn't do much equalizing not just in this scene, but anywhere on this map. It could be different in other maps, but for this map I found the strongest setting to perform best, since all those super dark shadows were cranked, making it easier to distinguish someone hiding in the dark places of a map. Now apart from AI's current flaws, this gets me excited for what MSI can bring to the table with future versions, because not only have they improved on it from their failed attempt on the MAG251RX, but as far as I know, they're the only company to implement an AI-based black equalizer. Keep at it, MSI. Okay, now that that's over with, how's it when it comes to gaming on this monitor? Well, it's pretty good, and just like what you would expect from any other ultrawide. Like I mentioned on the overdrive test, even though 60Hz has some overshoot on the lowest setting, I didn't even notice it when playing low refresh rate games like Star Citizen. When it came to competitive titles, response times were fine enough. Input lag was also as good as it gets for this refresh rate, so if you're worried about that, don't be. Now sure, this isn't a 240Hz or 360Hz monitor, and yes, it doesn't have the best pixel response times. But one, this isn't a monitor meant for competitive gaming, and two, you can't take those response time tests at face value. Do I think the Alienware looks better than the MSI without its backlight strobing? Sure. Is it that much better that it'll actually help? No. What would help is a really well implemented backlight strobing technology like Zowie's Diac. But Zowie creates 16x9 TN panel based esports monitors, and this isn't that. With that said, this monitor was set out to do two things make gaming more immersive and give you the ability to be more productive, and it does those two things well. With a 1440p resolution, not only do you get a crisp image, but also much more screen real estate than if you were to purchase a 1080p ultrawide, a 16x9 1440p monitor, or even a 16x9 4K monitor, since with this, you're able to keep the windows at its normal size. One thing I should mention before we move on is that when you're smooth scrolling, text does smear a little bit. This is typical of VA panels, and the Artemis is no exception. Next is the color performance. The Artemis covers 100% of the sRGB color space, 83% of the Adobe RGB color space, and 87% of the DCI-P3 color space. So it's got good coverage for you creative gamers out there. But you will need to calibrate this monitor, which if you're interested in learning how to do that, click on a pop-out banner over here. The reason why is because even though this monitor does have a dedicated sRGB preset, it doesn't clamp the color gamut. In terms of Adobe RGB and DCI-P3, well, there's just no color profile for them at all. If you're just an average user though, 
that is, you don't professionally edit anything, then you'll probably be happy with the monitor's out-of-the-box color performance. Grayscale performance was pretty good, giving an average Delta E of 3.1, which is about 1 to 2 Delta E's more accurate than many other monitors I've tested out-of-the-box. It does run a little cooler than it's supposed to, giving an average color temp of about 7000K, which is a bit higher than the target 6500K, but that's still a pretty good out-of-the-box color temperature for a monitor focused on gaming. Plus, some people just like a cooler color temperature anyway, so it's not that bad. When it comes to gamma, that was the worst performer here. With an average gamma of about 2.1, bright highlights won't be as detailed, but it's not like it's going to ruin the image since the gamma isn't too low. It's worth noting that the monitor does not have a gamma adjust feature. When it came to the saturation sweep, the monitor did oversaturate, most notably the reds, but with an average delta E of 2.9, this is pretty good out-of-the-box color performance for non-professionals. The default color accuracy was also decent. Again, with an average delta E of 2.79, I doubt most people will be complaining, since colors will generally be accurate. Before I move on to the calibrated performance, for those that want to know what I adjusted my monitor's RGB values to before starting the calibration process, I set it to 100 red, 92 green, and 81 blue, and that helped grayscale performance quite a bit, giving an average delta E of 2.2 instead of 3.1, an average color temp of 6600 instead of 7000, which is much closer to the 6500 target, and kept the gamma about the same. Calibrating the display yields perfect results. You have an average delta E of 0.7, which is below 1, meaning that it's perfect to the human eye, an average color temp of about 6550K, and an average gamma of 2.26, which is slightly higher than the target 2.2, but it's still pretty much good to go. Saturation was also perfected, giving an average delta E of only 0.52, which again is perfect, and a max of 1.5, which was the pure blue. Color accuracy was also perfected, giving an average delta E of 0.63, which for the third time now is perfect, and colors look exactly like they're supposed to. Uniformity was also good, though the entirety of the top and bottom columns did end up being worse than the middle three columns, having a vignetting effect. And while the uniformity test doesn't capture it, the left and right edge of the monitor also has a vignetting effect. Overall though, this is good performance. If you're interested in trying out my color profile for yourself, I'll post a link in the description. Just keep in mind that this is made for my particular monitor and that it may make your monitor more or less accurate, which you won't know unless you have a color emitter to check with yourself. As long as you're happy with the results though, it really doesn't matter. Brightness was pretty good with a typical brightness of 333 nits, making this bright enough to view comfortably with the sun shining through your window. If you have the RGB value set to 19281 like I mentioned earlier, the minimum brightness is 105 nits, which is quite high. If you set it to the middle, around 50, 42, 31, it'll be 45 nits, and if you set it to the lowest, which is 18, 11, 0, then minimum brightness is 11 nits. So you have a lot of range and a lot of freedom in terms of minimum brightness. And being that this monitor has a VA panel, contrast was awesome at 35, 22 to 1. Okay, so now that you have all that information, how was the media consumption experience? Well, it was mostly good. When I first started using this monitor, I had just come from the Alienware Ultrawide, which uses a nano IPS panel. And going from that to this? I thought this was a downgrade, not gonna lie. But after using this for about an hour, my eyes got used to it like nothing really changed, as most people do when they go from one display to another. Now sure, if you put this side by side against a nano IPS panel, I bet most people will go for nano IPS, because it just looks so damn good. But one big issue with Alienware's is the contrast ratio. I don't know what it is with Dell, because this is a Dell issue, since LGs aren't typically plagued by this. But every time I test out a Dell IPS monitor, their contrast ratio lands around 750 to 1. That's almost five times lower than this. So blacks here will actually look black, whereas with the Alienware, they'll look gray. Everything else about this monitor is about what you would expect. Good coverage, good brightness levels, and good color accuracy out of the box or calibrated. What's not as good is the backlight bleed. It's got a lot of bleed in all four corners. With that said, I haven't actually noticed it when playing games or consuming media. Really, the only time I've noticed it is during this test. Viewing angles also aren't the best. They're not bad, but they're not great. No matter which angle you look at it from, there's a high contrast effect. So it's not as good as IPS, but it's nowhere near as bad as a TN panel because this monitor didn't have any angle discoloration from what I could see. Lastly is the OSD. If you've seen any of my other MSI reviews, then you already know what to expect here. Basically, it's the best OSD of any monitor. I'm not going to go crazy in depth because I've already talked about it enough times, but I will go over the new stuff and skim through each section. So if you want to pause the video to see what each page has, go ahead because it's pretty self-explanatory. Okay, this is the default menu which has everything right in front of you. 
The new stuff here is the screen assistance and optics scope. Now, screen assistance has been on other MSI monitors, but MSI now has added a couple more crosshairs, at least from what I've seen before. That's all. Optics scope, on the other hand, is much cooler. I've only ever seen this on one other monitor, and I think it was the ASUS VG259QM, but what it basically does is it just zooms in the center of your display. Select the zoom amount and the size of the zoom box, and bam. If you're playing a game like Escape from Tarkov, Arma, or what have you, get ready to start accurately sniping people from across the map. My only criticism is the size of the small box. It's just not small. I consider this more of a medium box size, and would prefer something at least two times as small. Next, we have Split Window, which lets you select whatever apps you want to split, and your split type, so it splits it all for you. Then Tools, which has a bunch of the window settings, and Macro Key, which when you press the Macro Key on top of the navigation nipple, does whatever function you set it to do. So in conclusion, should you get this monitor, and is it worth... What? $90,000? Oh, that's just a typo? So it's $900. Okay, that makes more sense. <clears throat> okay, so is it worth $900? Well, I think it is. It does a very good job with out-of-the-box color accuracy, at least my unit did. Casual gaming is great with its massive 1000R curve, its high 3500 to 1 contrast ratio, good colors, great input lag, and good enough pixel response times. Competitive gaming is good enough, but as I said earlier, you should not be looking at an ultra-wide, especially this, if you want the best competitive edge. The resolution is good, so you have a decently sharp display that allows you to have a lot on screen at once, as well as a crisp image. The black equalizer is great, whether you use the strongest setting or the AI setting, at least in certain games. And the OSD is among the best I've ever used. The only issue I found with this monitor is the lack of a color vibrance feature. Which, yeah, you could use NVIDIA's software for that, but why do that when you can have it tied to a monitor's profile and do nothing? Also, I think they should have either a different VA panel suited towards gamers, or tweak the voltage of this one via a software update, if that's even possible. I'm talking pixel response times. They're not bad, they're just not great, and I would like better all while keeping the high contrast, which is why I'm not against VA panels. I mean, you saw what Samsung did with their G7 and G9, right? That VA panel competes with gaming-focused IPS and TN panels. So I would have liked to see that come to this, and at least future monitors from now. Other things are the poor backlight bleed and the HDR. You didn't think I'd forget to talk about HDR, did you? In a nutshell, it's just not good. There's no local dimming, the peak brightness is low, and it does nothing to enhance the experience. Though I will say, it is better than most other HDR400 certified monitors I've used in the past, because it doesn't overexpose the crap out of everything. But should you get one? Well, I think you should. The reason why is because, as I said, this is only the second ultrawide I've ever used and reviewed. The next review is also an ultrawide, but one that my brother lent me, and he's considering returning it for an upgrade. He asked me to help him look for something better within his price range, and then I got carried away and looked at all ultrawides at all price ranges, and noticed how difficult it is to find an ultrawide that does everything well for a relatively affordable price. And for $900, this monitor seems to do everything most people would need or even want, and that's why I think this is a good buy. But I know it's an expensive purchase, so if you're not lucky enough to take advantage of a return policy, and if you're not totally sold on it just yet, that's fine. You also shouldn't take my word as gospel. You should cross-reference my information with a lot of other reviews. And since Amazon won't even ship this out until April at the latest, there's no rush. With that said, I have a lot of other ultra-wide reviews coming up, and I will compare those with this and the Alienware to see what's the best bang for buck for a particular category of ultra-wides. But for now, this has my seal of approval. Thanks for watching. If you guys enjoyed the video, leave a like. If you disliked it, leave a dislike. If you want to check out any of the stuff I featured in this video, visit the links in the video description. Follow me on my socials if you want to see some cool upcoming stuff. And as always, have a great day, every day. Peace.